Good afternoon, welcome to another 8 Push video with Mr. Pate for Barlow High School. Today we're talking about the beginnings of World War I, causes of the war. Let's get right into it. A lot of different causes of the war. First thing we've got is militarism. You'd had these neighbors that were trying to get supremacy over each other, and they'd been doing a military buildup for a significant amount of time. They had even gone to war at different times, which we'll talk about more in a minute. France versus Germany. Uh, you had, uh, you know, the Ottoman Empire and Russia. You had Serbia with Austria-Hungary, which Serbia is, of course, not a major power, but you had these battles, and as they had this hostility toward each other, they would try and do military buildup. Germany, in particular, also tries to cha challenge the naval supremacy of Great Britain, and they decide, we'll build the biggest, best warships in existence. And then, of course, the British respond by building something even bigger, because they look at the ocean, the waterway, the British Channel, as their basically freedom, their protector, and having the best navy is the way to ensure that holds up. Okay, so that's militarism. You have an um, increase in just arms, in the size of armies, in types of navies, in modern navies. Nationalism. You have yellow press in all of these countries that are just feeding a frenzy of nationalism, and our country's better than that country, and everybody's just getting fired up for war. Uh, imperialism. You had a battle in Africa and the Middle East, down off the map, for who would be in control. Uh, you had a significant battle. You had long-term in, in imperialistic nations that had had colonies forever, such as France and Great Britain and Spain and uh, you know others too, certainly. But those were the main ones of the kind of old-style ones. But then you have Germany and Italy trying to get into the act. And so almost all of Africa by the time of World War I has become, uh, really by the turn of the century even, was subjugated into some sort of protectorate or sphere of influence or just outright being kind of a new colony, so to speak. The battle over colonies is another factor that kind of gets more powder in the powder keg ready to explode and cause the war. Prior wars. This is something different than you'll hear about in your history books, but it really makes sense. The, the previous wars all were fought without trench warfare. They did not have new weapons like the machine gun and later on primitive tanks, barbed wire, um, poison gas. All of these new inventions are going to come about. The navies weren't as extensive. You would have land battles. One country would defeat the other. The diplomats would come together and the winner would take some land from the loser and they'd shake hands and go on their way. This is going to be a much more desperate struggle the countries are going to get dug in, and another difference is you get all of Europe in on this. And at times, the European kind of balance of power politics, everybody gangs up on Napoleon, or a lot of people ganged up on the British during the American Revolution. But it's really not the same as getting a fairly even battle in on both sides with terrible new technologies, which dramatically, similar to the Civil War, we will see that the uh, technology is way ahead of the tactics and they're just going to spend years sending people to get slaughtered by machine guns before they figure out that that really doesn't work very well. Um, they never really learned that lesson. But the prior wars were a poor history lesson for them on what this would be. A lot of men from all the sides said, I'll, just like the beginning of the Civil War, like most wars, I'll go get some glory, it'll be over quick. Uh, it's certainly not going to be the case here. It's going to be unbelievable bloodshed. Neighborhood rivalries, I called it. You know, France and Germany had gone to war several times in the last few decades um, over contested land that was on their border, this, this mineral rich area called Alsace-Lorraine. They had this battle over that. Um, you had um, territorial disputes between the Russians and Ottoman Empire. Um, the Austro-Hungarian Empire did not recognize some of these countries like Serbia and Albania and was kind of bristling at the fact that they were trying to be independent. And, and, and you really have so a, a variety of rivalries and, and ways. and you know, I, It's just a significant thing that they are jostling for land, not only in foreign imp uh, imperialistic colonies, basically, but also just the territory right on their borders. We see something similar to that today in some areas of the world. A significant one would be uh, the Kashmir region of the India-Pakistan border is significantly disputed. They both claim it's theirs. It's a very hostile thing where both sides are very mad about it. Okay, so these are all going to be long-term causes that over 
you know, a few decades leading up to the war. They're just building and building and building toward this big war. Um, one thing I did not put up here, and I can't believe I left it off, I tried to leave it for last, is the alliance system. I guess I'll just get to it down here in a minute. Uh, I meant to have that as a long-term uh, cause as well, but it, it, which it certainly is, but I'll talk more about it in a minute. Early action in the war. So uh, you have the assassination of the Archduke Franz Ferdinand. He's the heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne by Serbian nationalists, uh, Serbian terrorists. And so they kill him. Austria-Hungary Austria uh, is going to say, well, we are interested in you basically being absorbed into our country, and they make some very harsh demands on Serbia. Serbia refuses their demands, so they declare war. After checking with kind of Big Brother Germany, who's more powerful and has built up a bigger military, they sanction this, and here's where the alliances come in, and we talk about this alliance system. There were a number of known alliances, France with Russia, and Germany with Austria-Hungary. But there were also a bunch of secret alliances that were not as well known. And what's going to happen is, when the secret alliances uh, become known, it's because everybody's piling into the war. So let's kind of see how that starts uh, and brings things in. Austria-Hungary Hungary is going to declare war on Serbia. Serbia has a secret alliance with Russia. Russia is only too happy. And keep in mind... All of these countries, basically, just about all of them, pretty much, they still have a monarch or dictator or something. These are not democratic countries where the will of people is involved. These are monarchs that want and emperors who want to just take over more land. Um, so Russia is a secret alliance partner. Serbia, they come in. France is their partner. So they both declare war on Austria-Hungary. Germany declares war on France, Russia, and Serbia. They bring in the Ottoman Empire, which is a rivalry with Russia, joins what they call the Central Powers um, with Germany and Austria-Hungary. Romania and Bulgaria are going to jump in as minor partners on their side. Serbia and Albania are going to jump in. Italy, for the first year of the war, I didn't make it entirely red, Italy starts out on the Central Powers side. A year into the war, they're convinced to switch sides. So Italy actually becomes uh, one of the... Um, the uh, opposing force, the Triple Entente. Um, so what's going to happen? Italy caves in basically and switches sides. Um, how does Great Britain get into the war? Well, it's, it's like this. Germany comes up with a plan called the Schleifen Plan. And the Schleifen Plan essentially is this. It basically, Germany said, well, we've had long-term problems with the French. The French are always out to get us. We're out to get them. Let's go ahead and launch an assault on France, but a sidestep all of those uh, defensive forces waiting for us on that border. So Germany is going to send their troops through Belgium in what's called the Schleifen Plan to basically go around and then down into France. And it works out really well because they do get into France. By the time the French are going to be able to get their defenses set, um, and then basically they kind of stop the forward progress in kind of northeastern France and you have basically this western front that develops uh, on the, on the you know, board, well not even, it's into France, not even on the border of the Germans and the French and the trenches get dug and with, it'll move back and forth a little bit but this border is basically going to, this is going to be the front for this whole western half of the war. When Belgium gets invaded, and this is now right on the coast of, again, the English Channel where Great Britain is. Great Britain comes in on the side of France and reinforces it. And so you have Netherlands and uh, Belgium as well as France and, and Great Britain on, on the Western Front. Now you will notice Portugal, which is unlabeled, Spain, Switzerland, Sweden. The, there are countries, Ireland, that stay neutral and do not get involved in the war. Uh, one of the things that's, it, oh, and then I don't really have the Eastern Front up here, but um, you have a, an Eastern Front that's largely into Russia. Russia, of course, is eventually going to pull out of the war when they have the Russian Revolution and sue for peace, and they're going to give up some land which eventually becomes, you know, kind of Eastern Europe. They'll give up this land, and then, you know, when Germany loses, this will form independent states such as the Baltic Republics, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and uh, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Poland, etc. 
Trench warfare, no one was prepared for this type of war. It's very different. It's going to become this brutal stalemate. And I said already, you know, the technology is way past what the tactics they're going to use. And eventually it's going to be kind of the exhaustion and wearing out of the Germans more than like advances in tactics that's going to allow the victory by the uh, triple entente that is, you know, the British, French, Russians, later the British, French, and Americans. The U.S. response initially under President Woodrow Wilson is going to be neutrality. We're not going to get involved. Americans do not see this as their fight. This is across the lake, as they say. It's clear over in Europe, across the Atlantic Ocean. U.S. will get drug in later when uh, Germany, you know, starts to attack kind of their shipping. And, um, you know, th there are some natural reasons for this. The British are going to blockade Germany's coastline. Uh, Belgium, uh, Denmark's not labeled up here either, but it's independent country, of course. They're going to uh, blockade Germany's coast so they can't receive any material. So the United States comes in willing to trade with everyone. When the British cut it off, they're basically only able to trade with the British and the French. So the Germans resort to the U-boats, this early submarine, and they start sinking U.S. shipping so that the U.S. can't have it, and that's going to be a major factor that leads in. But that's more of a, a topic for the podcast and kind of what we'll look at in class with, uh, you know, all of these different issues around German and U.S. relations and submarine warfare. Until next time, that's all we've got for today. Stay classy, Sam Barlow.